Hi, I'm Shana from Sage Country Herbs, and I am here at Mount Pisgah Arboretum with Mountain Rose Herbs, and we're going to go and enjoy some of our plant friends of the Pacific Northwest. Come along. So let's look at this next friend right here. This is actually one of my, I say favorite, but it's like picking a favorite child, which is not really possible. So, but it is actually one of my favorite plants. Um, really the way that I could say it is that this plant here is one of my most longest standing relationships with a plant. This is organ grape. It is Mahonia aquifolium. And I know that because of how high it's growing. Um, so Mahonia aquifolium, formerly Berberus aquifolium. Uh, it is part of the Berberidaceae family, the organ grape family. So a long time ago, when I first started studying plants, one of the first plants that I really developed a strong relationship with was organ grape. And the reason, it wasn't the first, because I actually did multiple different herb schools to get different perspectives. Um, and so my third herb school, um, what I call my alma mater, um, would be the Columbine School of Botanical Studies. And the reason that that one was so impactful for me um, was because we went out into the field and we actually learned the plants that grow natively and the ecosystems that they grow in and how to learn ecosystems based by the plants in the area. It's kind of like going to a new place and learning like you could be a tourist and just learn the landmarks that tourists learn or you can move to a place and you can actually get to know the people who then take you on the quiet private hikes that tourists never go on. And that's what I feel like it's a really good actually analogy to herbalism that like, yeah, you can go to the store and you can buy a tincture of this or a tea of that. And, and you know, echinacea is great. And I love tea of holy basil and these are wonderful. Um, but once you really get into it, you start learning that there are all kinds of herbs that are not necessarily the most popular. Um, and they may even be really popular in their given environment, but they may not be like the most popular on the market. And to me, the development of that relationship with the plants that grow around me, not just with ones that I plant in my garden, but also the ones that choose to grow in these environments, that's cultivating a relationship with the ecosystem itself. Um, and it also helps to pull away from that concept that, you know, this herb is good for that. That plants are here so that we can use them for our own benefit. That, you know, egocentric way or human-centric way of looking at things. And, and you know, initially, of course, that's kind of the, the segue into learning about, about plants. If you're not someone who's just growing, like, flowers for beauty or, you know, plants in a garden for eating them, when you really start getting into learning about plants for using as medicine, it's of course an easy way to think like, oh, what, what plant is good for, you know, this cut on my finger or what plant is good for my clogged sinuses or whatever. Um, but the more I got into studying plants, the more I realized that learning plants is so much more than learning their actions or even the constituents that they're made of. So much more about learning plants to me is learning their ecosystems and where they grow and what role they play in their ecosystems. Who are their pollinators? Who uses their leaves as, you know, fodder to be able to make their nests? Or, you know, really getting to know the plant in much more important terms to the plant than just how it's going to work for me. Now, of course, I love using plants in that way, and this one is a powerhouse. Um, but really getting to know it is, well, I love teaching by analogy and metaphor, so I'll give you another one. Um, it's learning more than the name. And we all have these friends that are, well, more like acquaintances. Like you know someone's name, and you may recognize that person, but sometimes maybe in a big group of people you won't recognize them because there's just so many others. But when you see them in a given environment or by another person, you always recognize them. But then there's those friends, like those friends that are like a piece of your heart. And it doesn't matter how many vast faces there is, you always know who they are. It's almost like your heart speaks when you see them. And it's like, oh, like I can just like walk right to you and wrap you up in a hug because my heart knows that you are that friend. You hold that place. And I feel the same way about plants, that there are plants like Oregon grape here that I'm walking along and I'm like, oh, 
hey, it's so good to see you. Like, it's a relationship. It's a, I recognize you. I see you as more than just, oh, I can use you to help kill an infection. While I have done that, and I will do that again, I can also see the role that it's playing in its ecosystem. You know, I can see how this one is standing tall. Um, I can see how this one is also commonly planted um, around banks and around like government buildings. And, and the primary reason are these really beautiful, vibrant, but dark, deep green leaves. And they're actually pretty leathery. You know, they've got a pretty thick texture, like leathery texture. And then they also have these edges that are spines. And I feel like those kind of help to add a layer of protection um, in terms of landscaping, but also that when they're in flower, their flowers are vibrantly canary yellow. And the contrast of the canary yellow with this gorgeous green, vibrant, like forest green color, it's really beautiful in landscapes. Um, and then even where it's at now with these awesome blue berries, um, that look very similar to grapes, which is where it gets its name. Also a really nice contrast and really beautiful. Uh, so the berries and the flowers um, and the leaves, like these are all just part of ways that we can use to be able to identify, to be able to tell. You know, I can say that these leaves, that Oregon grape specifically has compound leaves and a compound leaf is made up of leaflets. And we know this is a compound leaf because at its base there is a bud. And at the base of a leaflet, there is no buds. And so we have these compound leaves. They, they have these opposite leaflets that then end in one terminal leaflet here. It is a woody plant. Now there are some organ grapes that grow very low to the ground. But if you pull away the leaves, you will still see that they are woody plants. And then it's also getting to know the ecosystem that it grows in. Very commonly, you're, you'll hear people say, oh, it's Oregon grape root. And then very commonly, I hear people get confused, like, oh, we're using grapefruit from Oregon? No, <laughs> it's Oregon grape root. Oh, it's a grape. Well, no, it's not actually. Grape is vitus, is its genus. Uh, it's not actually even in the same family as grapes. Um, but that's where common names can be difficult. Um, and as some of my mentors have said, common names suck eggs. And that's because it's called Oregon grape. It doesn't only grow in Oregon. It grows all over California, all over Washington, all over Vancouver. It's a very common plant. Um, and it's not actually related to grapes at all, but the berries look like grapes and they hang in bundles like grapes. So that's where that, that relationship comes from. Um, so very, uh, very common, but also commonly confused with other things. Some of the claims to fame of Oregon grape do whittle down to a plant constituent called berberine. And it's not only found in the Mahonia or berberis species um, or genuses, I should say. Um, there are other plants that do have berberine as a compound. Um, and I would also like to say, I think it's really important that we don't just focus on individual compounds. I mean, that's really what makes holistic herbalism um, different than pharmaceutical drugs, you know, where we're, instead of focusing on just one main compound, we're looking at how all the compounds all have a symphony effect in the plant. Um, but berberine in organ grape has actually had a lot of clinical study in its isolated form. Um, berberine is highly antibacterial. It's clinically shown in petri dishes to be effective against gram-negative bacteria like staph and strep, which are two uh, bacteria that can be really aggressive. Of course, there's also the, um, the issue with staph becoming antibiotic resistant. So recognizing that there are compounds like berberine that can actually work um, against bacteria that um, are often more resilient against a lot of our antibiotics. So berberine is wonderful in that way. 
And I've never actually isolated berberine um, as an herbalist. I'm a whole herb herbalist. So I will make an extract of, usually the root is the primary part that's used. There is a little bit of berberine content in the leaves, so they can be used, but the root is definitely um, has the, the most, and it's not even the root, it's the root bark around the root that has the most berberine content. Um, so other things that berberine has been clinically shown to be effective is actually um, in, well, the bitterness of berberine stimulates the liver to produce more bile. More bile means you're going to break down your fats more efficiently in digestion. So this is wonderful all around. Carry that out. Fats are really important to be digested properly because fat is both a raw material for making energy, but fat is also a raw material for making every, remember, every cell in the body is made up of fat and protein. And so when we have, you know, when we have good quality fats and protein in our diets, we make good quality skin. We make good quality blood vessels, all of these different things. So um, things like berberine and organ grape root are wonderful with helping with digestion because of that bitter flavor. This is actually where I started my relationship with organ grape. Um, I had impaired digestion and I was having a lot of things like, you know, stinky farts and, um, and some belches here and there and some pretty stinky, you know, other things. So um, in seeing an herbalist, I learned about Oregon grape and I was a budding herbalist. So I was really excited to start relationships with plants. And I started using Oregon grape as a bitter before a meal. It only takes a drop or two. It's just the taste of a bitter. And that actually, not only does it trigger your liver to produce more bile, but the taste of bitter on your tongue tells your brain to, to tell the whole GI tract to turn on. So you start to salivate, your stomach starts to churn, you start secreting hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes. Literally, the taste of bitter turns on all of digestion, which then means that you're going to digest your food more efficiently, which means you're going to get more raw materials out of your food, like and on and on and on. So good digestion leads to nice skin, better brain ability, more cognition, more focus, better ability to move your bowels. Like, all these wonderful things. That actually plays into the physiology of bile. You may use the organ grapefruit to encourage the liver to make the bile. And then that bile goes into the gallbladder to get concentrated. And then that gallbladder contracts, pushes that bile into the small intestine. And that bile then helps to break down fats. But that's not all it does. I love physiology. It's so cool. The feeling of bile on the small intestine wall actually triggers peristalsis, which is that wavy muscular contraction that helps to move food down. So then when that, when that food gets to the colon and the bile is mixed in with it, now that bile is also actually affecting the colon. And so now you've got that ascending transverse and descending colon that also gets engaged with the peristalsis. And this is really important for having a healthy bowel movement. And I'm a big proponent of talking about our bowel movements because it's a taboo subject and that's really silly because we all have them and we all do it. And it's such a big component. Like people who don't poop regularly are not happy people. So we should be able to talk about pooping more and things like organ grapefruit actually help with that. And that is really cool. Let's see, what would be the other things that I use organ grapefruit for beyond just those really key things that are really important it is a liver stimulant. And I think that's really important to understand when things are liver stimulants, we need to be careful about stimulating the liver, which is a primary detox organ when people are on pharmaceutical drugs, especially drugs that need to maintain a specific amount in the bloodstream to be effective. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that we can't use herbs. It means that we need to be more educated about the way that we use herbs. Um, and what this means is that we need to be careful, um, you know, in being a teacher for many years, I've had thousands of students and it's really easy for people to just think, and, and, and I've heard this a lot, oh, I love using natural things because nature is so safe and gentle. No, no, nature is not safe and nature definitely does, is not always gentle, definitely not. Um, my usual response to that is, Arsenic is natural, and so is cyanide. And those things can kill you. So it's really important that we don't just think, oh, natural things are totally safe, which means that we can just use them willy-nilly. No, no, we really want to be careful because something like organ grape, which is a liver stimulant, 
part of that stimulation may be of the detoxification pathways and may be detoxing a drug like, say, birth control pills or thyroid medication or heart medication, things that need to remain in the bloodstream. It's really important that you learn to cross-reference. It's really important if you're going to dabble that you learn how to do research and how to, part of understanding how to do research is understanding basic physiology and all the different things that play a role. So I definitely really appreciate Oregon Grape Root. I often use it in a small amount um, in a formula um, for immunity and helping with infection. Um, I use it in, in liver formulas that are primarily nourishing and I'll use just a small part of an Oregon grape root um, or a Mahonia species to give a little liver push but only a small amount because I want, what I notice is that most of my clients in my clinical practice are not people that need to like kick themselves harder but people that actually need to slow down and nourish themselves more. So I wanna be careful with anything that is overly stimulating. Um, and so that's where my favorite way to use Oregon grape root is as a bitter, because a bitter is just a taste. It's one to two drops, you know, it could be, you know, even like five to 15 drops, but we're talking about a very small amount. Um, and that way you're not having nearly as much of a huge liver push as just a, oh, I'm waking up my digestion. And I really appreciate it uh, for that because it's, it's really, really effective. Um, and I found it to be incredibly effective um, with really simple things. One of my favorite ways um, to use a bitter, because there's a lot of different reasons to use a bitter, you know, um, having impaired digestion, you know, having a lot, of, a lot of things like gas or indigestion, or maybe you've had the flu for a week and you just haven't been eating a lot because you've been burning a fever and your digestion is just, you know, your stomach is not telling you that it's hungry, but you're really weak and you feel like you need the fuel, but you're not hungry, but you're really weak because you haven't eaten in a week. Um, that's where things like organ grape root as a bitter can be incredible because your stomach is not telling you that it's hungry because it's basically turned off because you haven't been eating because your body's been focusing your energy on fighting an infection. But you can turn that around by just a couple of drops of a bitter like organ grape and all of a sudden you feel your stomach start gurgling. And just like that, like, so recovering after a long illness, bitters are great. As I mentioned, indigestion and gas, great times to use a bitter. My personal favorite time to use a bitter um, is with a fatty food headache. And a fatty food headache is a headache where, um, well, it stands out for me. There's a lot of different types of headaches. The two primary headaches that I get are either dehydration headaches because I live in an environment that's very dry and I have to remind myself to drink enough water or I can get a headache when like my neck is out or I slept wrong or that type of thing. But a fatty food headache is different. Number one, it often is kind of coupled with a little bit of indigestion or just like, oh, I just feel kind of like, oh. Number two, an aspirin's not gonna cut it or any of the over-the-counter, you know, NSAIDs or pain relievers don't make it go away. Um, and water doesn't make it go away. Um, what I, well, I can just give you the example of, so many, many years ago, of course I wouldn't do this now, but many, many years ago, I got a pint of ice cream and, um, you know, it was one of those fancy brands with all the extra, extra yumminess. And I'm eating my pint of ice cream and I'm thinking like, oh, this is really good, but I should probably, you know, it's like half done. And, and at that point I turn to the nutrition effects and I see that like, actually I've now eaten two servings. Oh. Okay, I have to put this away. And I put it away. And then like it's been like an hour and I'm like, well, maybe one more bite and like you go and get one more bite and then my attention goes away and I eat more. And and then all of a sudden it's like, oh my goodness, I have eaten oh my head. Eating a whole pint of ice cream will definitely give a fatty food headache. <laughs> and at that point, it's not a it's not an ice cream headache. It's not that like, ah, it's just like, ugh. And it's amazing how Oregon grape root, it really is amazing because what's going on with a fatty food headache is basically you've eaten too much fat and it's not being processed appropriately. And what that bitter flavor and that liver stimulant is doing is helping your body 
to basically break down that fat appropriately and make it so that it is being digested the way it's supposed to and being used the way it's supposed to instead of causing you to feel horrible. Now, of course, eating a pint of ice cream in general will often make you feel horrible because it's just a lot. Um, but really like this could be, maybe you like to eat, you know, fried mozzarella sticks and dip them in blue cheese dressing and used to do that when you were a kid all the time. And then you go to a place and you see fried mozzarella sticks and you're like, oh, I used to love those. And so you go and you get some and at the end of the meal, you're like, oh, bitter time. It's a perfect time for bitters and Oregon grape root is a wonderful uh, bitter to be used. The last thing I want to say about Oregon grape is, um, okay, maybe it's not the last. There are many different um, related plants in the Berber Dacia family. There are the, a, a wide variety of Mahonia species. Uh, down south, there's also a tree um, called Algerita that is also a berberine containing plant. There's also some other, other plants like Coptis or Golden Thread um, uh, or golden root, I'm sorry. And then, um, and then of course, there's also golden seal. Um, but we don't tend to use golden seal very much unless it's farm grown because of the endangered aspect of the plant. So Oregon grape root is one that I really appreciate being able to use because it grows so plentifully. Even with that, when you're harvesting a root, generally you're killing a plant. I mean, that's just a, a general across the board. When you're harvesting a root, roots use, I'm sorry, plants use their roots in order to stabilize them as well as be able to pull energy from the earth and to be able to hold energy. And so if you're going to harvest a root, oftentimes you're killing that plant, but not always. And Oregon grape root is one of those that there are some species that are ground cover in, in the Pacific Northwest on the West Coast, um, especially in moist forests like the Cascades. There are areas of the Cascades that you literally cannot put your foot down without stepping on Oregon grape. And this is really cool because they grow clones of themselves. So they have this root that's called, it's, a, it's actually, they have what's called a rhizome. And a rhizome is a horizontal root. It's underground and it's running horizontally and then it has little rootlets that come off of it. And those rootlets are actually how it's interacting with the earth. But the rhizome is basically like going out so that it can put up another plant. And so when you're walking on a ground cover of Oregon grape, you're actually walking on clones of all these different plants that have created clones of themselves. So the coolest thing is when it's really moist year, you can actually dig through you can unearth the root and this root may be going from a plant here all the way 10 feet over there. So I can dig down and I did learn this from the Columbines school and I'm very thankful for that because it's wonderful because I can dig out some of this rhizome. I can cut out a one or two foot bit, keep that planted. And then as long as I leave, you know, I've heard it's six to eight inches. I just make sure I leave a full foot of root and then I can replant that plant. I took just this middle section and now I'm replanting that root of that Oregon grape root. And I have done this where I've gone back to the same place over and over and over and never impacted, I've never killed a plant because every plant, I've even gone back to the same place and dug out a plant that I actually harvested in the year or two before. And I could see, oh, there's a big root and then it becomes really small where it started growing again but that means that the plant made it. So to actually be able to harvest a root of a plant and not kill the plant and then come back and see that that plant has continued growing. Oh, like to me, if you can figure out how to use plant medicine where you're not actually hurting plants, like that is um, the end all be all of, of, um, of being able to be an active member of your ecosystem and not just a consumer of your ecosystem, which I think we need to be really careful of as herbalism becomes and, and nature um, and wild food foraging becomes more and more popular. We need to be really careful about making sure that people understand these are finite resources. And if everybody just falls in love with plants for the way that we can use them, then unfortunately over time, they can get over harvested. 
And so being able to recognize how we can either harvest plants without hurting them or find other more invasive plants that can serve similar purposes. Um, better yet, recognizing that we all have a herbal medicine cabinet in our, if we have a spice cabinet in our kitchens, we have culinary herbs, we have a medicinal herb cabinet as well. And so there are so many different ways that we can access plants. I love learning the native plants in my environment and my ecosystem. I also love learning the ways that we can either work with or find other plants to work with so that we're not actually hurting our ecosystems. And this plant is part of the inspiration for that. So cool stuff. Thank you so much for joining us for a plant walk at Mount Pisgah. And I hope you come back and see more plant walks and maybe I'll see you out in the field.